Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network. Welcome to the Drafting the Circus program. My name is Frank Santoroski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk about this big uh, weekend in racing that's behind us. Joining me in the studio, Luis Torres and Richard Uden. Guys, how we doing? Good, thank you. Yourself? Not too bad. Luis? It's going all right. Beef filled, beef, beef for racing. Beef for for racing. Yeah, I tell you, we did have a... Uh, quite a weekend of racing we have a new winner in nascar we have a new winner in formula one we have a guy in indycar who's won just his second race um pretty good races all around we had uh, an interesting xfinity race (laughs) as well Mm. uh, that we'll get into but let's um let's lead off with the british grand prix because um uh carlos Sainz took his first win there and um this was one of the more exciting Formula One races of recent vintage. I mean, those last 10 laps. Uh, I, I mean, if you uh, stop watching Formula One because uh, it has gotten boring, it's time to come back. It is time to come back. Uh, you know, we had uh, as, as many as five and six cars that are battling for a position at the front of the field uh, right there towards the end. But at the end of the day, it was Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari taking his first win. Um, but uh Race got off to a bit of a rocky start. There was a a bit of a scary incident involving uh, Zhou Guan Yu, um, who got his car upside down and uh, slid across the track, across the the, uh, across the trap, over the tire barrier and sandwiched himself between the tires and the fence uh, sideways. Um, The guy was fine, uh, took a while to extradite, um, you know, remove him from that car. Uh, uh, but uh, here we have uh, the halo saving another life, uh, quite obviously, as the um, uh, the roll hoop seemed to fail on that car entirely. Now, now, Richard, yeah. is, it, is it my understanding that we're not building the roll hoops quite as strong now because we have the halo? Uh, I had read a comment no. like that. Uh, Mm, I think that's a pretty misguided comment. In all fairness, if that's uh, what's been written, no. Th- as far as I'm aware, the the regulations for the um, halo strength uh, are as as tight and as um, demanding as they ever have been, as they should be. Right. Um, the the interesting takeaway that I had from this, um, and that's something that may be addressed, is that um, Alpha Moreo, who uh, Guan Yu Zhou was uh, driving for. They run with what is is, is called um, like a, a shark fin um, roll hoop. So it's not really a hoop; it's more of a blade. Ah, okay. um, and with the engine, you know. So typically, on on, on every other car in the, in the field. The roll hoop is a is a hoop, and that forms part of the engine air intake um, system. Mercedes first ran with this concept back in about 2010, uh, where you have like a blade roll hoop, um, and the the um, engine intake is, is just purely a cosmetic device that acts as an engine intake. There's no structural integrity to it, but it does meet all of the FIA regulations. And a number of other teams have run with that concept. I know, I say Mercedes started with it. I think um, Caterham, when they were in existence, they ran with it. Um, And and Sauber ran with it and then for a few years and then it went away and now Alfa Moreo have picked it back up again. Um, But the FIA have looked at it very, very closely and it does fully meet their strength tests. now, we don't know the loading that went through the roll hoop in this instance. We don't know how, we you know, the force of the impact that that roll hoop sustained 
uh, during the impact. And it, it, it's going to be significant, obviously, to cause it to, um, to fail in the way. Now, that being said, when they, and I've, I've witnessed these on a number of occasions, these royal hook tests, they're what you call a static test. So you have the, 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 the monocoque or the tub in a, in a, <clears throat> a fixture that's you know, non, non-moving fixture. And they apply what you call a static load to the roll hoop. And whatever that load is in the thousands of newtons, tens of thousands of newtons, whatever it may be, um, you know, that they they have to see zero deformation or a very limited deformation of the, the chassis through that loading. Uh, now, of course, what you saw, saw in, in, in Joe's instance here was, yeah, you have the impact, but it's also this shearing motion as the car sliding down the track. I remember, I could be speaking out of turn here, but I think it was a BMW potentially of Nick Heidfeld or maybe a Sauber. I think it was Nick Heidfeld. So either a BMW or a Sauber back in the day that had suffered a very similar failure where the only thing, the thing that saved him in that instance was actually that the engine was higher than his head and his rollover hoop failed as well. And again, it's under that sort of shearing motion rather than the pure static load. Um, So maybe that's something to look at. But to go back to your original point, um, I've seen nothing to indicate that these these tests are becoming less significant and less stringent. And I think that we have again seen the effectiveness and the justification for running uh, with a halo uh, in, in in Formula One. Um, and you know, we actually saw on the Sunday morning. Uh, an incident in the Formula 2 race uh, involving Roy Nisani and um, another another F2 driver where um, the driver actually hit the inside of one of the sausage curbs and, and landed on top of Nisani's car. And again, if it wasn't for the halo, then there could have been significant injuries there. So I think uh, the halo has proved itself that in the space of, of four or five hours on Sunday there, it say if it didn't save two drivers lives it certainly saved them from serious injury um so again that's another check in the box for the halo there yeah i mean there should be you know no doubt that uh especially with the you know with the roll hoop failure there that 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 halo did its job and then it seemed to have you know zero deformation after the fact and and you know it was, it was quite a tumble he took and, and quite a ride he took upside down uh, yeah. And then getting sandwished in between the, the fence and the and the yeah and the tire bar, which I, I, I which is another thing they really need to probably have a little look at there. Um, yeah, you know? I, I I don't think where the car ended up was pretty extreme to be to, you know in all fairness. Yeah, um, yeah, that's quite unusual. I think the, yeah, that's a, yeah. I I don't think personally there should be too much emphasis put on where the car actually ended up. The catch fencing again did its job. Um, and and the driver was very lucky that the car went in belly first into the into the catch fencing. And unfortunately, like you know, the opposite of saw with with Dan Weldon's tragic accident, um, where again a halo style device may have may have helped him. Uh, but definitely in in, in Joe's case, um, you know, going in backwards, if you like, and and belly first rather than front first. Um, certainly had a, a you know played an impact in there but um you know on the whole if you look but okay outside of the roll hoop failing for whatever reason it failed you know the FIA have got to take a lot of reassurance from how the safety systems work now it could be that they look they analyze the data and they analyze the crash data and the impact and you could be in a situation where you you fundamentally cannot design a roll hoop to withstand the impacts and the stresses within reason that that car suffered. So you may get to a scenario of, well, the primary tool, the roll hoop, didn't work, but the secondary tool in the um, the halo did its job. So, you know, without going overboard with the halo design, or sorry, with the roll hoop design, you know, maybe we're, we're in a good spot. 
Yeah, it sure seemed like we're in a good spot because, uh, again, you know, everybody everybody was fine after the incidents, both the Formula 2 and the Formula 1 race. So, yeah. So speaking um, of the Formula 1 race, then let's uh, on the restart, then let's uh, let's take it from there. Yeah, I mean, it was a restart that in reality was a start. Um, you know, everybody that survived the first quarter melee, um, you know, went back to the grid. So we lost we lost three or four drivers there on the um, first start. Obviously, Joe, George Russell, who'd been involved in the contact, Alex Albon, who had another big hit uh, and actually ended up going to hospital for some precautionary checks on his ankles because he did. He hit the wall pretty hard as everybody was checking up to avoid uh, that initial impact. But... Um, yeah, you know, it was it was an entertaining race without any hesitation. Um, you know, on a on a circuit that really does bring out some pretty good racing over the last few years. Um, Charles Leclerc got a little bit of damage early on, lost one of his end plates, uh, but but was able to maintain and push Carlos Sainz pretty hard. Um, Perez had a similar incident and he lost his end plate to his front wing, but had to pit and uh, you know dropped all the way back to, you know in the back. So. You know, it's, it was interesting to see how those differences worked out for, you know, t- two different drivers with, with relatively similar um, car issues. But as the as, as the race progressed, um, Hamilton came into the mix. Uh, Leclerc got past Perez and was, uh, you know, set to win or set to have a very, very strong result. Uh, Max managed to get some debris from one of the Alpha Towers wedged in his brake disc or brake brake cooling duct, I think it was, or one of his brake aero components on the rear of his car, which which had a pretty significant impact on his performance. And first he thought he had a puncture and then, you know, he just, he was not a sitting duck, but, you know, struggled to maintain any semblance of, of competitive pace throughout the remainder of the, of, of the race there. Um, we then had a late safety car uh, when I think it was uh, was it Ocon had a some sort of transmission uh, failure um, on the old pit lane uh, on the old start finish straight and it was I must admit I think he was a little bit um, naive made a mistake in that he didn't actually take for the old pit lane which he could have easily done which would have prevented the need for a safety car. Um, safety car comes out. Leclerc, who's leading, didn't pit. Science and, and and Hamilton, who were second and third, did pit. I thought that Ferrari had enough of a window there to stack Leclerc and Science. They chose not to. So Leclerc was on twenty lap old hard tires, um, whereas Science and Hamilton had brand new soft tires with only ten laps to go. And uh, Unfortunately for Leclerc, there was, was really nothing he could do to, to hold off those two drivers. Um, and, I mean, he gave it a good go. Goodness me, some of the racing and the battles that he had with Hamilton were were phenomenal. Um, but it was, you know, inevitable that they'd get past. And Perez drove fantastically from the back of the pack from his earlier nose change through to, to claim a second-place finish. Um, which was, you know, great to see. But, yeah, Carlos Sainz won his first race, much deserved. Uh, you know, got his first pole position, first race all, first race win all in the weekend. Um, you could argue that all things being equal, probably Leclerc was should have won the race, could have won the race. But uh, you know, as we've seen for Charles so far this season, you know, if um, you know if it wasn't for bad luck, he wouldn't have any luck at all in reality. So um, yeah, you know, frustrating again for him. I think he came in finishing fourth. Uh, you know, an opportunity to to, to really bite into uh, Max Verstappen's championship lead there, but uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, they 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 couldn't take advantage of that. So, um, yeah, disappointment there, I think, from Ferrari. Um, but but all in all, you know, as you mentioned, Frank, a fantastic race with some fantastic, um, you know, fantastic driving. Really, again, these guys, you know, we were, I, I go on about it week in week out how these guys are at the top of their game. And and you know races like Silverstone really do does this highlight just how damn good these guys are. Um, you know it, it, it's phenomenal. You got to you know tip your hat to these guys. They are they're on fire. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not every day we see 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 so many cars bunched up towards the end of the race. We're usually you know seeing them spaced out pretty well. So uh, I mean for this to see and then and just just to listen to the crowd. 
uh, going nuts as Lewis was making up some ground there and and headed yeah. towards uh, headed towards the podium. Um, and you, yeah, you could just you could just feel the excitement uh, in, yeah. in the whole place there, even you and, know from from watching on television. I mean, to have you know, and it's over the course of the weekend, four hundred thousand people attend over over the three days. You know, and and you know, Saturday, Friday, and Saturday were typically British and uh, you know typically wet in places. <laughs> Uh, but you know, great numbers, great spectator numbers. You know, when you consider that a few years ago, Silverson was potentially under the chopping block uh, in terms of having uh, contracts run the race. But um, you know, I mean, Hamilton had a chance to win that race there. You know, there was I was watching it, and there was some points I'm thinking Lewis can get this. You know, and Mercedes just didn't quite execute. You know, the pit stops were a little bit sluggish. And yeah, I think I think that last. Know, the last safety car kind of put a bit of a damper yeah, on his chances, but but he still. Execute. Yeah, but I think the interesting thing that it highlighted for me was, you know, uh, of the seven years of dominance in the turbo hybrid era, they've probably never been at the top of their game. You know, the the car has been so dominant outside of last year, where they were really pushed by Mac. You know, they never really had any competition to their rival, to their dominance, especially with, you know, they'd normally seal the championship with two or three races to go pretty comfortably. So, you know, maybe they're a little bit, uh, you know, outside of like match fitness, if you like. Um, but, you know, it was good race, good to see them back. I think they'll be strong again in Austria. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk going around about this the flexible floor that some of the teams have been running with, which has supposedly aided their um, stability in preventing this porpoising that we've been talking about. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who, you know, potentially falls back as they, you know, do start to suffer from this more and who relatively progresses. But, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks coming up. Uh, you know, we've got uh, three races now before the, the summer break and, I really think from from Leclerc's standpoint, you know, he probably has to win two of those three um, to, to to really be in with a, a championship shout come the second half of the season in, in late August. Yeah, Verstappen gave up a few points this weekend with uh, with a, a seventh place, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, but again, again you know, and, and Charles, you can't. You've got to take advantage of fourth. that. Fourth, yeah. He, he, if he would have won that thing, he'd uh, he'd uh, you know. Bridge the gap, but uh, uh, another really, really, really good run from Alonzo, who is yeah. sh- show, showing yeah, that, that showing that oh, he's P5, far, far uh, P five right behind Leclerc. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's showing that he's far from uh, you know old and washed up. And um, first points for Mick Schumacher. Yeah, Mick had yeah. a you know solid race. And which which, which she de- which she desperately needs. He seemed to be yeah. in the news for all the wrong reasons recently. Yeah. So uh, good for him to to kind of walk out of Great Britain with a, a result he can feel proud yeah. of. Coco Bur, you're you know, gonna have to get the bold prediction right. But, uh, <laughs> that was my you know, bold prediction was... last year. With it, Schumacher wow. will get, get some points. A point. I mean, a point. Any points? Uh, yeah. I, I think that um, you know. He had a, obviously he took advantage of a number of cars that you'd expect to finish ahead of him retiring. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to execute again, haven't you? And, and they certainly did that. And, I mean, he could have. He was, God, dear. Those last two or three laps when he was battling with uh, Max, it was obviously going slowly. You know, think, oh, God, no, not again. We're not going to have a repeat in Miami where he, um, you know, tangled with, uh, with Seb with those couple of laps to go. But, uh, no, it was... Is a really mature, solid, you know, sensible drive by Mick, and he was, you know, an opportunity presented to himself, and you know, he did what he had to do. So, you know, hopefully, this will be the start of a little bit of a confidence boost for Mick, and you know, you can go. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying he's going to score points every week or, or anything like that, but you know, start building on there, start being closer to um, to, to his team, Mick Magnuson. Um, you know, if we're looking at, you know, Mick as a an, next you know, potential driver at Ferrari, for example, which I know has often been the talk, um, you know, he, he has to get into a position where he is, he is, he's beating Mick on a pretty, oh, sorry, um, uh, Kevin Magnussen on a pretty regular basis. Kevin, Kevin you know, Magnussen is a, a known quantity in Formula One. And yes, a very solid 
stock driver, but he's a he's a B list driver in my opinion. That's no disrespect to to, to Magnussen, um, but I think um, you know it, it's certainly um, you know it, it's certainly an opportunity to build on that, and he'll need to start beating you know Magnussen on a pretty regular basis if his career is to progress beyond. Um, you know, the Haas team, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, there's, you know, the talk for him this year has ranged from him getting sacked mid-season and, and Ferrari coming to save the day and, and convincing them to keep months. And now, you know, this is this is kind of the result he needs just for, oh, his, yeah. uh, just for his own well-being uh, you know when yeah. you have we have rumors like this floating around and and you feel like you're you're under the gun and you can't do anything right to come out of this weekend so hopefully he'll yeah. you know he'll get to get a you know like you said a confidence boost uh, he gets yeah. feeling to settle oh, yes I, I can do this i've got this and just see him improve from there and on that note um with um you know, somebody who's been under pressure performing. I know he probably didn't have the race result he wanted, but uh, Nicholas Latifi getting through to Q3 for the first time with his highest ever qualifying position in P10 there. Yes, there was some adverse weather on, on the staff during qualifying, but he took advantage of it and got the job done. Um, and, you know, considering the galling sort of decision for him, from his perspective by the Williams team to... Um, give all of the upgrades that were available for that race to Alex Albon. You know, he, he stepped up and, you know, obviously the, the, the weather is probably a bit of a, uh, you know, leveled that playing field, should we say, in terms of, um, you know, the upgrades. But, uh, you know, he, he stepped up and he did what he had to do and he got a really, really good qualifying performance there. So, um, yeah, again, didn't have the race result. Um, but, you know, f- fair play to the guy. He, he, you know, he's been under pressure. He's another name that we've talked about, you know, maybe, you know, st- you know, being demoted mid season. And, you know, there's lot, been a lot of talk of Os- Oscar Piastri coming in from Alpine as a, like a, a loan in driver. Um, but, you know, again, he, he, you know, he did what he could with the tools of old. And I think, uh, you know, credit where credit's due on that front. Yeah. Yeah. Great qualifying run for him. Yes. Sir. And to your point. Yeah. Boy, it was. It wasn't just inclement weather. It was wet. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. Nah, that was just a that was just a mere mere sprinkling of rain by Silverstone. Yeah, I was going to say that's just that's just Great Britain. Yeah, that's Great Britain on a Saturday. You know? Yeah, my house that was like five miles from Silverstone would have been bone dry while it was pouring down with rain. It's uh, your Silverstone has a little microclimate, and uh, you know I remember watching the race being you know, wet or, you know, overcast. And I say five, 10 miles away where I lived, it was beautiful sunshine or vice versa. Strange old place. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that, wouldn't that uh, line from the Beatles song? If the sun don't come and get your son from standing in the English rain. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, uh, all right. So we're off to Austria next. It's going to be a very, yep. very strong pro Max Verstappen crowd. Uh, he's got a, a ton of fans in that region there. Uh, yeah. they'll, be, they'll be looking for him to rebound from uh, uh, what by, you know, this this year's standards is a pretty, uh, pretty mediocre performance to seventh. Yeah. So, um, and, and again, and of uh, course we have a, it's a sprint race this weekend as well. So we have the um, Friday free practice one, a Friday qualifying Saturday um, free practice and then a sprint race on Saturday afternoon, uh, which will determine the grid. For the um, Sunday race, um, but uh, as we saw in Imola earlier in the year, they have increased the point allocation for the sprint race. So uh, I think all the way down to eighth now scores points for the sprint race. So that should uh, you know that should be good. Yeah, good some opportunity for uh, you know anybody that's close to their their rival there tighten up a little bit, come out of the weekend with a few uh, more points that are just available for the taking. So who do you so do you like do you like Max for uh, Austria because I sure do. I do, but I think I think you know Leclerc has to uh, you know I think he has to step up. So I'm gonna if I'm gonna throw my hat behind uh, into the ring behind anybody, I think it's gonna be Leclerc. I think you know they had too many mistakes, and this is this is the the, the crunch. You know now this they need to step up now and uh, yeah. you know, really do something, and and uh, hopefully this will be the weekend. Yeah, now or never. Yeah, it's crunch time, like you say. And Louise, 
What are, what are your thoughts heading into Austria? I wonder how Mercedes can carry this moment, their momentum they got. Of course, Hamilton had a huge run, a brilliant run, probably the best run he's had all year. And if he might, he arguably could have been in the hunt, but he ran, he just ran out of laps and signs was just a guy that was not going to be being this time. I'd be curious to see how Mercedes carry on, how George Russell bounces back from his top five streak being over. And above everything else, I hope like, of course we know Joe Guanyu is going to be okay, but also Albon as well. Because Al- yeah, Albon I was, think they've confirmed that he is. Yeah. Thankfully. Cause that was a, that was a nasty lick that he took. Yeah, he took nose first into the barrier, into the wall. No, and then he had to cushion it. Yeah, then he had two or three more bites at him as well uh, on the way through. So yeah, he uh, he got beaten up. All ends up uh, up there. Yeah, while while when you took a, a slide and all of that, this the saying like if you're upside down or you take some sort of air tumble, it alleviates some of the pain off of. There was no cushion with Albon, so no, none. Like because that was a hard hit when you think about it because it's a short straightaway. You go from zero to about one sixty, one seventy before you take the first corner. It's not a slow corner either. So oh no, it's. Fl- I mean, from a from the standing start, that'll be flat out that corner. Yeah, but it's it shows that it comes a a true long way. Now the biggest mystery when it comes to safety is how to handle those sausage curbs. As shown by the F two rate, F two or F three. Yeah, I mean uh, that. Uh, mm. That yeah, was a I whole mean, or different ordeal. How that went down, but with the sausage curves, it kind of proved that's like the big major concern. Yeah, and, but I mean the guy was off track and ended up being vaulted over the you know over the back of somebody, uh, you know over the back of the sausage curve. So it's like, uh, and uh, I, I know what you're saying, and and I think it's a very difficult concept because what is the, you know how often do you see a car in that position? Not Limited. a whole lot. I think the only and, reason yeah, why do is you gross. Keep, do you keep adjusting to every single scenario that you see? Yeah. But I think you've got to, at some point, draw a, a line under it and say, okay, you know, you, you do the analysis. What is the probability of this happening? What is the likelihood of that happening? And, you know, we've obviously seen the, you know, the, the halo come into effect, you know, multiple times in the last three or four years since it was introduced. But in the same time period, how many times have you seen cars launched by sausage curbs? I think only twice in formulas. Two. Yeah, there was the one yeah, in Mars, I can so. think of. So, you know, you, I, I agree with having, you know, the, I don't like the sausage curbs on the short area that the cars can take because, yeah, they do launch. But, you know, for somebody to go the wrong way over a curb and then, you know, criticize the curb design. It's like, well, should he have been there? Now, I know he was he was actually forced off the track by Nisani, who's been penalized for it. Uh, and it was Nisani that got very lucky with him landing on top of him. So, you know, it's it, 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 it's a little bit of a, to me, it's a bit of a mute subject, in all fairness. Um, I My personal opinion is that you can't go around chasing every issue like that, because then, then you'll never... You know, you you'll 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 just keep doing this all the time. I think you have to look at it in, in relative terms and you know probability terms. Yeah, I, I agree. But uh, I, one thing I tend to notice it, it seems to me, and I don't know if it's just that that, that these clips get played more. That uh, Formula Two cars tend to get airborne more so than Formula One or Indy cars. Uh, it just seems um, like I I I think you're maybe looking at. Um, Ambition exceeding talent, I think, is one of the issues. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a lot of really uh, young, ambitious guys uh, in that series. So, yeah, but um, yeah, just for what it's worth. So, um, so Louise, so you're picking Hamilton. Is that what I'm to understand? I was more or less curious to see how he does. I think from a race perspective, Leclerc gets a sense of urgency and goes out with a W. All right. So, uh, and again, Mercedes is already saying that, uh, you know, they feel good about uh, Great Britain, but they're probably going to have a difficult race in Austria. But then again, we're used to Mercedes saying that sort of thing every week, even even when they when they dominate uh, 
They they, they talk about. Oh, uh, God, it's terrible. Isn't it? <laughs> I know, right? It must be tough to yeah. be. Oh, we all, I mean, the number of times they like got a one-two by two minute by like and lapped everybody and said, "Oh, we almost didn't finish the race." Oh, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sand, so. yeah, this is the same thing they saying. They, they say, oh, we're going to stand back. We're, we're not optimistic. And they goes out and wins the championship like nothing. Like nothing. Yeah. So, exactly. all right. So let's uh, let's move on because we've got a lot to talk about. So uh, IndyCars were in mid-Ohio this weekend uh, where we saw Scott McLaughlin take uh, his uh, second second win on his season, second win of his career. Um, in, in the meantime, we saw the Andretti team just implode. Uh, you know, we had a uh, Grosjean, we had Rossi hitting Grosjean, Grosjean hitting um, Herta, <laughs> Rossi great, hitting, wasn't hitting, it? hitting <laughs> Francesco, you know, so much so Michael had to pull everybody in for a little come to Jesus meeting after the fact there. And, uh, and, and Grosjean has called his teammate a complete idiot in a recorded interview. Uh, so I uh, had not quite sure what's going on there, but we've, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, dysfunction within the Andretti camp and my gosh, all that came to a head, but, uh, but, but in the meantime, smooth sailing for Scott McLaughlin at the front of the field there, uh, taking a really good win, but there was a little bit, a little bit of controversy during the race with the, the seemingly delay on, on calling the yellows uh, for a couple of incidents here where we used to have the yellow yeah. come right out and, and the pits being closed. We had a, uh, one incident with Kyle Kirkwood and another one with uh, Tatiana Calderon where, where the, the yellow seemed to be delayed and guys were able to make pit stops. And I think that one, they, they, they just delayed the yellow until most of the field had made their stops, but there were like uh, one or two guys that caught out a new garden got caught out. Um, yeah, and the, the one incident I didn't like that. Heard heard it got caught out in the one incident, but that was I think that was his own fault for not pitting, um, or he he was unaware that the yellow was about to come out. Uh, again, more dysfunction within the Andretti camp. There, uh, he was he was uh, not really happy on the radio when he said, "You have to tell me what the is going on." Um, so uh, yeah, just yeah, a little a, a little yeah, little this. little inconsistency with the way. We apply that closing the pit rule, which which drew the ire of some competitors and fans. Louise, what was your take on that? Oh, <clears throat> we're as a far cry to where we were back in 2005. Because for the people forget, back in 05, they were all like super best friends and best buddies, like Kanan, Weldon, Herda, and all those Frank Keating and those folks. We're a complete we're a complete contrast to where we were back in 05 when they were the team to be. This team is capable of winning races. If everything are assembled well enough, all of them should be in the championship mix right now. The fact that nobody, nobody from the Andretti Cup is really in the hunt legitimately. You have Groshan that you can quote on course say is not delivered. Herda is Herda, inconsistent. Rossi is finally getting it together after the fact he's signed with McLaren, but he hasn't won in a long time. De Francesco's had episodes. There's it seems like they need this was the moment that was this was their implosion that honestly if they're going to get any better they need to get it together they got that it was bound to happen stuff like this but the fact that this team cannot coexist and where they ramming off people and it's just confronting it's just it's just utter lunacy and it's just kind of like what what happened to them sure andretti and even back when it was andretti green they've had moments in the past before the for before 2005 but if you if these guys are going to be viewed as a legitimate threat to the championship, they they got to be. They, sometimes you got to coexist, and I feel like you look at, I look at it at qu- quantity and quality again. They have quality drivers, but how much of the quantity has been able to deliver on a more consistent basis? It hasn't happened in a while, and you see teams like Penske that has scaled back and look what they're doing. They're the basically one of the only they they're the team to beat. McLaughlin and Newgarden. They're repeat winners. They're the only repeat wins this season. Will Power was able to bounce back from spin, capitalize on those full course yellows to finish third on the podium. He's still in the championship. Huh? Ganassi is Ganassi. They're going to be consistent, quiet. They don't have to show flashes of brilliance. Outside of Errol McLaren's, in, who they had reliability problems, Andretti is the one that uh, looks scary for all the wrong reasons, when it should be scary for the right reasons for the competitors. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and and, uh, and to your point, yeah, thank you for mentioning that the uh, double DNS for the McLaren boys, uh, both mechanical Felix early on, and then Pato, who who had really control of the race through the the first third of the race. Um, it just you know mechanical or electronic gremlins there. Um, kept losing power and he kept trying to do different engine mapping modes and eventually ran out of modes that were working and had to park the car. Uh, I mean, that's and two, two bad results in a row for a award, isn't that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then again, Felix, who had a really good car out early, he was very disappointed. Um, but uh, I want to say one of the other Chevrolets had some uh, similar issues, but, uh, you know, it's hard to... I think it's Foyt with... Kirkwood and Keller, they also had a tough going. Kirkwood was on another top 10 run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, that went it went south in a hurry. Yeah, but it's hard to uh, pin a lot on to Chevrolet when they had, you know, two guys on the podium uh, in the Penske camp. You had McLaughlin and Power there on the podium with uh, Palou in between them. Uh, so, yeah, but Chevrolet is evidently going to look into this, but, uh, but for a very disappointing weekend for the McLaren guys who would, who did really, you know, a fantastic job through practice and qualifying and, and just, you know, walking out of there with zero results to show for it. Yeah. That's going to put him in a hole as far as, especially notably part of the be in the mix. Sure. The top half dozen or more separate by like with under 70 points, but at this point, a lot can be ripped caught up but they got to be active about it because after beginning next week the grind really sets takes off with you have toronto then you have nashville you have the double header in iowa and then and then of course the brickyard yeah not they, in they, that they, order but it's coming up well it's uh toronto then iowa, iowa then, then yeah the brickyard then, then, then brickyard then nashville yeah so they've got they've got a busy couple of weeks there and uh, to your point, if somebody gets on a roll and, and you got to look at a guy like New Garden for when you talk about guys getting on a roll, uh, you know, especially with Iowa right there where, where New Garden has had some pretty fantastic performances. Uh, he's got two shots at it. Uh, and, you know, he's a <laughs> he's right there in the championship. Um, Erickson has quietly been consistent, but uh He's he's going to be overtaken in this championship if a guy like Newgarden or even Will Power gets on a gets on a roll here going or and you know Palou's right there in the mix as well, so it's uh, a lot a lot could happen. But to your point, yeah, if Potter wants to stay in this thing, uh, they can't have they can't have these uh, mechanicals. Yeah, and when you look at it, Ganassi needs to win. Period. I know Palou is in the mix, but Palou has been quiet, but not like Dixon. They gotta they gotta start winning at the and this stretch to be right after to go to with Erickson. Otherwise, Pesky's gonna catch him up. And we who knows which Erickson's gonna show up. He's been putting on a it's been a banner year. He's been getting progressively better every single year he's been in the sport. When you really think about it, right, right. But yeah, Dixon's uh, winless streak is beginning to stretch out a little bit. Not as long as say uh, Rossi's. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's been 14 months now. Yeah, I was gonna say it's very unusual for for Scott Dixon, who I think the last time that he oh had a whole season where he didn't win a race was in 2004. Yeah, 04 was his last winless that's a, campaign. That's his last win, winless campaign. So and, and I you're think it was talking, either 15 or 16 that he won very late in the year. Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Mm-hmm. No, 16, because 15, he won the championship. 15, he won the championship, yeah. It got the, the, the tiebreaker because he had the wins over Montoya. So it had to be 16, I believe, where yeah, he won very late. Very late, yeah, but he still won. So, but he, like, like again, he's got time to win one this year. Yeah. Uh, but last year, he won early. I think it was with Texas. Yeah, the first or, Texas or, race, yep. and that's it. And that's After it, that. yeah, so... Uh, yeah, we don't want to ever stick a fork in Scott and say he's done, but uh, it's, no, uh, he's, it's it's he's it's been a minute. Yep. Yeah, he's, he's still still in the hunt, and uh, and to your point, Palou is still in the hunt. Palou's not won a race this uh, year yet either. Yeah, so. that's why that's why I brought up the Ganassi. They need to win because that's where Penske have the advantage right now. Oh yeah, you got uh, New Garden's won three, McLaughlin's won two, and Powers won one. So they're all all their guys have uh, have, have visited victory lane, and they're they're all. 
three solidly in the mix. And New Garden's a little bit, uh, no, I'm sorry, McLaughlin's a little behind the other two. Uh, yeah. But, but he's certainly, uh, you know, the top, I think I want to say the top five guys are all pretty close in points uh, right now in IndyCar. So it's uh, really still anybody's game here. Yeah, for sure. Right. We can tell who it's going to be tough to be like an Assy at Penske. Qualifying, on the other hand, we don't know which team is going to be on the pole. We could have a 10th pole sitter in as many races in Toronto. You never know. Yeah, and going to Toronto will be interesting because we haven't been there since 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. It's the uh, first international race since then. I'll be yeah. the only time they go outside the States, but to a point. Yeah, so it's been a while since we've uh, been up there. So that'll be, uh, you know, you've got guys in the series that have never run there. Uh, then of course you've got guys in the series who've been around a while too, like, you know, Elio and Simon and will have all been around Scott. Uh, so, but, uh, it'll be, it'll yeah, be so, interesting to see, to yeah, get, and- get back to Toronto. They've, they've usually got a pretty, pretty good, um, crowd out there. Pretty enthusiastic race fans. Uh, you, you know, we've got uh, a couple Canadian drivers they can root for and Dalton Kellett, you know, and so, in theory, this could be deemed as a wild card race because I think a good chunk of the field never dr- raced there. Uh, I think out of the 27, I'm willing to bet there's more than 10 to have a run there. I have to double check that. But I'm going to stress this thing right now going for next week. Peacock. Exclusively a Peacock race. We'll start that right now. So people spread the word. People forgot. If you want to see the Grump, the Honda Indy Toronto, it's through Peacock only. The one race that is not on NBC or USA Network. Wow, I left everybody speechless with that. Well, yeah, I mean, so. Oh, I, 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 I was, I was talking here, just jabbering away with my mute on. So, but anyway, what I was saying was, uh, in regards to the Peacock race, it's just, it's just kind of annoying when I read these comments from from IndyCar fans that say, "Oh, no, it's time for the IndyCar race, but I can't find it." You know what I mean? Because, oh, NBC Sports, oh, that's not here anymore. What is it on? USA or, or NBC? No, it's not there, you know. But if you know when the IndyCar race is, right, you're looking at the IndyCar schedule. It's on the, the IndyCar. And, it's on the whole and, page of IndyCar. I know, and the IndyCar schedule tells you the broadcast partners for each race. So I can't, I can't buy this, oh, you know. But but then, then there's the whole, well, I'm not spending $5 a month for Peacock to watch one race. I'm like, well, hate to tell you. You know, I've been spending five bucks a month for Peacock uh, for a couple of years now. And there's a whole lot more out there than just this one Toronto race. I hate to tell you, (laughs) you know what I mean? You've got every practice session, every qualifying session, replays of every race, not to mention you've got movies, television, and and just all kinds of other content that that the whole family can watch here. So for for people to kind of really get their, (laughs) you know, Get their panties in a wad over four ninety nine a month for Peacock Premium. I'm like, come on, you know what I mean? Yeah, which well, is why I'm I'm emphasizing. Some people, is the- that's why I'm emphasizing it right now. Exactly, because- exactly. Well, yeah, you're gonna hear about it next week. People will. Well, I didn't watch it because I don't. I already paid enough for cable. I'm not paying for something. I'm like, shut up. So if you haven't <laughs> used your free, if you haven't used your free trial, if they're giving it, or if you have Xfinity, you might be eligible. I'm getting Peacock without any payment, which I have yet to do so. On yeah. The so, well, speaking of Xfinity, let's that's that's a good segue uh, to to go to Road America, where NASCAR w- uh, was in action with both the Xfinity and and the Cup guys uh, out of Road America. In the Xfinity race, we saw uh, <laughs> no Gregson make no friends on the day, particularly not Sage Karam. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, Gregson and Karen were having a, a heated battle on the track there. And um, Gregson just intentionally, very much intentionally, just kind of took him, uh, took Sage out and um, 13 other cars in the process. Yeah, it, I see it this way. He pretty much kind of like had enough of it, did it probably in the worst part of the track and imaginable at a blind spot going before, turn four where all the dust and smoke in the grass, a lot of drivers are trying to s- scramble. No matter where you go, you you had nowhere to go. John Hunter Nemechek went through the grass. He got involved. Brandon Brown and, and many, uh, even his cup 
Coral is con- cup teammates. A colleague raising got wiped out in this thing with like the Atlantic Castle and Daniel Hemmer were involved. Maya Snyder took another hard lick this season, a heavy one. It looked like the Watkins Glen incident where at a blind spot, nowhere to go. You have to scramble. If you scramble, it's just not going to look. It was just not a pretty ordeal. Fortunately, Brandon Brown is okay. He just got knocked the breath out of him. That was a hard hit. It wasn't a blind spot. The fact that Gregson did it, if he really wanted to do it, he should have just bumper locked him into turn number five in an opening era. So he goes off course. But even with that, I would be dumb. The fact that it, it took out a lot of drivers made prime, Alpha Prime, which is Tommy Joe Martin and Cesar Baccarellas' effort, irate. Crew members of that team are irate. I know someone personally that from that squad has been irate. With, was irate. It's, everybody's irate. Junior was not happy. I think, who else? There's so many people unhappy. I imagine Matt Colley, who is his top owner, Gregson's owner in the Cup Series. I don't think he's happy because his cars, his quasi teammates, we're we're in t- we're involved in, in a mess that that should have not happened. It's kind of like, it reminds me of Ernie Urban at Talladega in 1991, stuff like that where you you gotta be my you gotta be careful. And the in fact thirty five thousand dollar fine, thirty driver owner points gone for Gregson. That's the that's the severity of the penalty he got. Yeah, he's already in the playoffs though, isn't he? So it doesn't make yeah. any difference. Yeah, really. Yeah. The only thing that's going to affect him is just being a regular season champion, which I think right now, I think it's between Ty Gibbs, who won the race at Road America, by the way, who had a masterful drive. He was patient, which is the thing that he he is slowly getting better is being patient. And he drove a masterful race. He didn't have to use, he tapped him a little bit on the final, but Larson made a rare driver error, gave Gibbs the room, and Gibbs went on to red. But somehow, Gibbs, who was the big heel, the big villain in the Xfinity series, is now looked as a tweener at most, unless you're Sam Mayer, <laughs> which is a whole different story. And then Gregson is now the ultimate villain. And this is not the first time Gregson has done stuff like this. I will have to look back to the k and West days with Todd Gilliland and also how he won his first truck race at Mosport, where he pretty much blatantly dumped Gilliland out of a first win at that point. Yeah, I just, you know, this day and age, I I just, I just find it really irresponsible to use your car as a weapon. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's 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 just, just, you know, especially when you, if you just look at all the collateral damage, sure, he's he's having a beef with Sage Karen, but look at all the other guys who had nothing, nothing to do with that. And and all those mechanics have to rebuild all those cars. You know what I mean? It's just. It's 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 like of all people, it's like the one that's most that drives for IndyCar is also occasionally Xfinity Series. And mind you, the car that one of the cars that took a heavy lick that was the thirty one of my Snyder. That was Karam's ride from last year. So I'd imagine he's not. I, on top of that, is you pretty much have some. I'd imagine some people that work for Jordan Anderson's team in the thirty one for Maya now work with Sage as well. And they didn't. I imagine they're not happy about it either. Because that was used to be their, f- their former driver out there. Yeah, I think the only people happy about it are the um, Sargento Cheese Company. Oh yeah, who got a little, <laughs> little bit, of, got a little bit of free, free, free advertising when one of the cars picked up the billboard and ran it around yeah. the track. Yeah, Sage Karam's um, Car- Car- teammate Josh Balicki in the yeah. the other Alpha Prime car. Yeah, and it even made it to Sargento's social media's profile photo. I mean, the banner photo. So at least it got some publicity like Echo Park did at Charlotte a couple of years ago in the Roval. Right. But at right, the, end so. of the, the end of the day, I think people have pointed out that Greg is trying to be somebody that he's not. And I think. Well, he, he's being exactly who he is. Well, I was you referring know, I mean, to Tim. I was referring to Tim Richmond. He's not Tim Richmond. And if, if, if we're yeah, talking about this senior. At the end of the day, you know, you're, you're, you know, actions speak louder than words. And what he did, I mean, Lewis, you've covered it pretty well. I don't really have much to add to it. But yeah, that's really my yeah. frustration at this is the way NASCAR have handled it. They, to, to my mind, I think they've bottled it. They had an opportunity here to make an example of a young, hot headed driver who 
has been known this year to make rash decisions when it comes to interacting with other drivers. Now, I know NASCAR has I want to say whole... just this year for the past half decade. And I, that's why I brought up well, the t- incidents with Todd Yeah, Gillen. I was trying to be polite. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they have this let the boys race mentality. And I get it. You know, if you're racing and, you know, I don't have any, any problem with, you know, pushing some, you know, making it hard for somebody or making it, you know, cutting a cut, you know, pinching somebody on an apex. Don't have a problem with that. Deliberately putting somebody in a, in a, you know, on an oval, like you know, pushing somebody up into a wall, that that leaves a, you know, a sour taste in my mouth. But what he did here was went went to, to my mind went, you know, beyond the limit of expectations. Um, you know, he to put it bluntly, you know, he endangered the life of other drivers. You know, period. There's no there's no two ways about it. Yeah, a blind um, spot, and spotters can't even really tell from that yeah, point. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, if, in all fairness, they probably don't have the cognitive reasoning to, to sort of understand that sort of thing in that, in that situation, but it's still no excuse for what he did. And you look, you know, you go back three or four years ago when Matt Kenseth wrecked Joey Logano at Martinsville, he got a two race ban. Um, yeah, you bet the was, truck series, Johnny Sauter got sat out for doing heinous actions with Austin Hill at, what was it, Iowa, I think. Yeah. They, they and, set an example on Sauter by suspending him. But, you know, but, but were, were though, you know, to my mind, especially the, the um, Matt Kenseth one, was stupid and petulant and deliberate and, you know, again, there's no place for that in professional racing. But it wasn't dangerous. He just wrecked Logano. You know, he was at Martinsville. It was in a 40 mile an hour corner, he wasn't really going to cause much damage. I mean, you know, he could have, you know, his actions could have led to the, you know, serious injury to competitors. And, you know, I know these guys, you know, don't get me wrong, when they put their fire suit on and the helmet on and they climb in a car, whether it be closed wheel, open wheel, amateur, professional, whatever it is, people know the risks and there's risk involved. And to, to a lot of these guys, that's why they do it. But you do not go out there with the concept and the notion that your life is going to be endangered deliberately by somebody else. And you know what? If if the the rest of the drivers had anything about them, I know it's not going to happen. They turn around to NASCAR and say, "We're not going to race at wherever it is next if this guy's in the field because he's a danger." He does that again. What's to say? What's to say something different is going to happen? You know, it, it was inexcusable in my book. And, you know, I, you know, I, I'll be totally honest here. I'm a little bit surprised that Junior Motorsport hasn't turned around and done something publicly about this. You know, I'm sure there's been some, you know, words said behind closed doors. But, you know, Dale Junior is, is very responsible on this thing. He's, you know, he's, he's very proactive when it comes to safety. Um, You know, he's been a big campaigner for a lot of the safety systems, which we've seen in, in in NASCAR these days. Um, And it's obviously very difficult for him to openly criticize in public one of his own drivers. But, you know, personally, I think it would be justified if he turned around and said, okay, NASCAR aren't going to do anything about this kid. We are going to bench him, you know, for a couple of races, let him sort his, you know, his, his head out and realize that you cannot drive like that. Um, I know it's not going to happen in reality, but I'd be very, very, I am disappointed that there's been no public statement uh, condoning his actions there. Yeah, it's just one of those things where, yeah, I know Junior said that he needs to take the aggression out of the, or is it out of the toolbox and all that, but. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's be not more, condemning that's, yeah. it, is it? That's just making a comment, you know. Yeah, there's, there's got to be more than, more than that. And with Xfinity, Going to Mid Ohio, for, I think fortunately for those in Xfinity, they're going to Mid Ohio instead of Atlanta, where the Cup guys are. Trucks and Xfinity are going to Mid Ohio. It's another road course, mind you, but they should have probably just sat them out on a road course and then bring them back after, and then maybe that serves the point. Because I mean, well, they suspended I mean, they... Sod- they suspended Sauter and they gave him a waiver, anyways. 
Yeah. He I, already I just won think at that, that point. Uh, you know, I, I, I know NASCAR's you know, rubbing his racing, but this wasn't rubbing. This was, uh, you know, if you'd done that on the street, you know, if you, you know, if you take that into context, I mean, if he'd, you know, God forbid, say he'd killed a driver by doing that, you know, the guy could have been facing manslaughter charges, you know, pure and simple, because he deliberately caused an accident that ended in somebody's, you know, death or injury, serious injury. You know, I've got, I've got no time for that. It's, and we've talked about this so many times on this show. You know, the young kids, they've never seen what some of the older drivers have seen on the racetrack. They've never been in a garage when there's that sort of eerie silence and, you know, that sort of feeling in the pit of your stomach when, tragically, another driver's lost their life. They've never seen that. They don't know what it's like. And they feel that they're invincible to it and they do stupid, petulant things like that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not good enough. No, it's not. And uh, again, you, you got you get guys sometimes they seem like they're driving in a video game, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and I wonder if that's a byproduct of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the fact that these guys spend so much time in a simulator and that, you know, you've got the whole video game culture uh, where, you know, the, you just the consequences are not real, you know, even yeah. though these guys are in real race cars. But, you know, to your point, we, you know, haven't had a really serious serious injury or a death in, in quite a long time so it so it almost feels like you are in a video game you know everyone everyone gets up and walks away so but anyway we did have a cup race and it was tyler reddick who won his first ever cup race and um first win for uh, rcr in quite some time uh since i think uh austin dylan won the 500 a while back 2020 texas 2020, 2020. Okay, yeah. So uh, they but, went one, two, I think, when Reddick finished his second. Yeah, that was when Reddick should have won, but he wasn't allowed to pass him. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, but good for another first time winner this year. We've had uh, we've had a couple, five. So five. Yeah. So uh, really, you know, we're we're just big time changing of the guard there. But uh, you know, Reddick didn't have this one fall fall in his lap. He. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was up there, you know, battling with some really tough guys um, who were good in road courses and, and brought this thing home. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, and it was getting a little bit concerning going into Road America. What's going on with Reddick? Because he and Chase Briscoe, I put him in a category of, they started off the season quite well in strong competitive fight, being in contention for Winsboro Loop, but it's been a while since they were in such battle. And Reddick, going into it, he was outside of the playoffs, which in my mind, I was thinking this team shouldn't be inside the top 16. There's no reason it should be outside at that point of the season, the way they were starting off pretty good. It just haven't had the luck to start off, and then ultimately, they just have not been there. But so I, I was, it was getting a little bit concerning, but I don't have to worry about it much longer since he became the 13th different winner of the year. The fifth first-time winner, which equals the modern era record set in 01 and 11 with five different first-time winners, and it makes me wonder how many more can do it. And I think somebody pointed out that over 40% of the full-time drivers this season have won a race. And now the question remains, are we going to see 16 or are we going to see over 16? We have still guys who haven't won yet, like Kevin Harvick, Ryan Blaney, and Blaney could probably find, a, if he could stay strong enough, be get strong results. And like Chase Elliott and Ross Hastain have bad results. Blaney could probably point his way into a regular season title. He'd be automatically locked in because if Blaney wins the regular season championship but has no wins, and if there's more than 16, he bumps. I'd imagine Cindric is in the bottom of the one-time winner points, I believe, still, or Swartz. Yeah, it's, uh, one of those guys. Yeah, I, I, I want to say it's Cindric, but it's either Cindric or Suarez are, are, are right there on the bubble if we if we have uh, the 16 winners. Yeah, so I'd be curious to see how that dynamic comes into play. And there's and we're going to Atlanta, where guys like it could be anybody's race. To be honest, you got if you're in the right line. And here in the front and the closing last, as we saw last time, you're probably in a good position to win. 
and, and you still have like Bubba Wallace, who will have a couple of different crew members because they swapped the 23 and the 20 pick crew. Christopher Bell, who is trying to get in the playoffs, he still hasn't won yet this season. Same thing with Martin Truex Jr. That's another one. We're so I was going to say, yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think Truex is one yet, and Harvick's not one yet, and uh, yeah. So, Alvarola and a slew of others. And there's a number of guys out there that could that could win races. There, Keselowski could sneak one in there. Yeah, you could um, still have Michael McDowell, who's been having the season of his career in terms of consistency. <clears throat> sure, absolutely, yeah. But uh, but but going back to the race, though, if you look at if you look at the guys that Reddick beat, you know, you're talking Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, Ross Chastain, all all there at the end of the race there. So so really. You know, that's putting him in some good company there. Uh, just uh, just a nice showing for that that team, and and for for him, who's been he's been chomping at the knocking on the door for that first win for a while. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been a long time coming for him. It's first time the eight car has won since Richmond of 06 with Dale Jr. It's been a long time for that eight car as well. I'll be at different teams, but the car number. So it was a big, certainly a big win, a much needed win considering the luck he's had all throughout the year, he should have probably won multiple races by now, but the fact that he's finally able to get one at Randall Burnett as well as the crew with the crew chief of Reddick, big momentum changer. The question is now who's going to be, who's going to be the guy to beat at Atlanta, which again is the high bank. the second time we're going to it. And William Byron was tough to beat when he was out front. So, the question remains, can he be, can, are the Hendrick cars still the team to be, or a guy like Bubba Wallace can get to find his way into victory? You never know what this, you never know, because we only have one race to judge. And it was a messy one for the mo- for much of the race until the very end. They got it together until they won him up at the final corner. All right. And then, of course, Atlanta is considered a super speedway now, which yep. is, uh, which I just find that to be interesting. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> if you call it Atlanta, Atlanta Super Speedway, its initials become ASS. So uh, somebody pointed out that the other day, I had a little laugh at that. But who do you like for Atlanta on the, the Super Speedway? I think I'm going to go with Byron for the sweep at Atlanta. This is the first revisit as well. So Byron could be the first one to go for a sweep in 2022. And Maya, this also now we're going to be going to circuits that we we ran already this season. We'll see how the product looks the second type of round. And Atlanta is the is a very peculiar one when you really think about it. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting race earlier in the season. Yeah, so it'll be uh it'll be fun to watch. And, and again, I've just I, I've enjoyed the uh, the progress of of the new car all year long. Um, to see how it performs at the different racetracks, but now now we got to start getting a second look at everything. So, yeah. So uh, again, you know, a lot of races left, a lot of opportunity to to sneak your way into the playoffs or get yourself bumped out of them. So uh, the race is on for the for the playoffs. I want to say for the chase, but we don't call it the chase anymore. So, but I believe we are just about out of time. So I want to thank you, Richard. I want to thank you, Louise. I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. I want to thank Mark Dill and Legend of the First Super Speedway and Dan Blay Automotive Art. Uh, you can find Dan on Facebook and get a custom diecast. And uh, But most of all, I want to thank you folks who listen to us. And until next week, well, good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-R-Z-O-C-O-M W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-R-Z-O-C-O-M Enter your website, enter your website, enter your website, enter your website.